Welcome, everybody. How is everybody enjoying the conference so far? Yeah? I know it's early in the morning. You can show a little more excitement. Woo! Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, let's go. All right. We'll try to keep you awake this session. All right. Um, so, welcome to Data to Your Considerations for Cloud Based Application Development. Long title, but essentially what we're going to discuss is if you're thinking about developing for the cloud, because ultimately everything's going to the cloud. We're not forcing you there yet, but as things go to the cloud and you want to start leveraging some of the benefits of the cloud, then what are these big, Azure, what are these, uh, all these data services up in the cloud? And how do I use these in my application? And why would I use these in my application? So we're gonna spend the next hour talking about what these, what these, um, uh, what these are. So before we get started, quick round of applause for our sponsors, yeah, <laughs> woo, yeah. We're just trying to keep you awake, that's why we're here, right? Um, so uh, please stop by their booth. Uh, that's why this happens, right? That's, um, all right, so uh, there is my, I look just like that. Um, but uh, if you have any questions about what we're going to talk about today, uh, there's my email address and my Twitter, uh, Twitter handle. Uh, I don't blog a lot, I should, but I don't. Uh, but if you have any questions about what we're gonna talk about, Today, feel free to send me an email or tweet me or things like that. I'm happy to answer these. We're gonna go, we only have an hour, uh, so we're not gonna go too deep, but we'll go deep enough, hopefully, that you'll understand, hey, what are these data services and why would we use it? You, you use these data services? Uh, and then if you have any additional questions, like reach out to me. Okay, also, I, I, one of the, um, uh, one of the, I think, fundamental, if you understand Azure, this is, this, this sums up what the cloud is, right? My, uh, my, uh, how many of us have another computer or need to spin up a VM or things like that, right? So this, this sums up what the cloud is all about, right? My other computer is an Azure data center. And I actually have these stickers in my bag. So if you want one, come up to me after, okay? Because you d display them proudly on your laptop. All right, okay, so. <clears throat> Uh, who's familiar with uh, Azure? A few of you, all right. So deep, you got things in production or are you just experimenting? Both? Yeah, okay. So hopefully we won't bore you this with this. But if you look at the entire spectrum of uh, our cloud services, data services, it becomes kind of uh, daunting, right? What are all these services that we have? We're not gonna talk about all of these today. And each one of these does not equate to a service, but it equates to the functionality that exists in the cloud, right? So I can do event, uh, event management, I can do uh, streaming of data, I can consume data, I can, you know, relational data, non-relational data, you know, big data, I can do, you know, uh, event streaming, things like that. I can do all these different things with all these different data services, so how do I work with these, right? Comp prediction. The session before this talked about how do I get better insights into my data through machine learning and things like that, predictive analytics. So we won't get into those. What we are gonna talk about are these three, right? We're gonna talk about relational, we'll talk about non-relational, and then we'll talk about, and in part, as part of non-relational, we'll talk about NoSQL. And we'll talk about uh, that from a, a, a kind of an end-to-end -end story. Why would you use these services? Okay, we good with that? So. So these are what we're going to talk about. This is our agenda today, right? We're going to start with SQL and a VM. We'll go, right? We'll then work our way across from left to right and talk about. By the time we'll get done, we'll talk about some of the NoSQL, and then we'll talk about uh, a search capabilities across all of these. All right. So let's begin <coughs> with a SQL Server and a VM. All right. So. One of the great things about, I think, Azure is the ability to get started very, very quickly. So how many of us have the need to very quickly spin up a dev environment or a QA environment or test environment very quickly? We may not have the hardware, but how do we spin that environment, environment up very fast? I need, a, I need a QA box, right? Or I want to see how my, uh, my database works in the cloud, right? Well, in Azure, we can do that very quickly. So things like there's, there's certain value, uh, value propositions for using SQL Server in a VM. Things like I want the benefits of the cloud, but uh, I know my database may not fit in the, in, the, in the Azure SQL database, and we'll talk about that in a minute. 
but it, it, it enables me to go very quickly to the cloud, right? And you start leveraging a lot of the features and benefits of the cloud. So SQL Server in a VM goes, I, I want to spin up a VM. And it also says, maybe I want more control of, over the environment. Right? So maybe I, I need the VM. Maybe I need to install additional things on that SQL Server box that I can't have in, in, the, in the pass offering, right? So there's benefits to going to the SQL Server in a VM. The great thing about this is you have great flexibility as to what size of VM you have in the cloud, right? Things from the basic tier all the way up to what we call the G series VMs. Things up, up to 32 core and almost 500 gigabytes of memory and up to 6,500 gigabytes of SSD, locally attached SSD disk space, okay? And you're not paying that much for that if you look at it. So extraordinary speed, things like if you want to run um, the in-memory OLTP in the cloud, you can do that now with these G-series VMs, things like this, right? So I get things from the A-series all the way up to the G-series and spin these up very fast. So how many of you run uh, virtual machines in the cloud? Okay, just for QA environment, test environment, things like that, right? So you know how easy it is to spin these things up. But there's benefits to that because it takes me, and from a migration standpoint, I love this because it's very easy to migrate. So let me jump out. <clears throat> For those that aren't familiar with the VM, let me show you really quick how this stuff works. <clears throat> All right. Whoop. Didn't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin up and show you how to spin up a VM really quick in Azure. And then we'll get into the, the interesting. So here I have a, here's my virtual machines. And I have several, which some of them are stopped. And the great thing about this virtu these virtual machines is if they're in a stopped state, you're not paying for those resources. You're only paying if it says running. So I've got two VMs that I'm paying for because they're in a running state. All the others I'm not paying for. You could spin up hundreds of VMs and if they're in a stopped state, you're not paying for those, right? So what I can, very simple, SQL to VM from the gallery. And, the, and so there's two op options you have. You can either take a, uh, if you have a virtual machine on-prem that, you want, that you want to use, you can upload that to Azure. Uh, SysPrep it, upload that. You can use that in, in Azure. But the difference between that is if you're uploading your own virtual machine because you have everything already set up, you're still responsible for the licenses on that box, both from the, from the uh, OS and from the SQL Server side, any other licenses you have on that box. But if you pick one from the gallery, there, you're not, you don't, there's no additional cost for licenses, whether it's the OS or the virtual machine. It's included in the compute for that virtual machine. So there's no additional cost. You don't have to up your license every year for this virtual machine. And we have a whole set of different uh, templates for SQL Server, a, a whole lot. So we can pick um, SQL Server 2000 per Enterprise. And if I say standard, look, there's, look at the size of those VMs, right? All the way from you know, one core to 32 core and just massive amounts of memory and, and disk space to that. And it's easy to calculate how much that's going to cost you every month just from the calculator on the MSDN, MSDN page for Azure. But that gives you the flexibility to say, you know, what do I need? And, and if you're trying to guess, well, what does my application need? You're like, oh, you know, I don't know. Because uh, you, what you want is when you, when you migrate your application and your database to Azure, you want that to run just as good or better in the cloud than it does on-prem. So how do you do that? So if you pick one of these and you say, all right, well, I want an A3, for example, so let's pick A3. You're not stuck with an A3 because we'll click cancel here. We'll go into one of these virtual machines. And I can configure that and I say, well, you know, the A3 isn't working. So I can pick another size. So I have the flexibility to change that to improve the performance of my application. And the great thing about this is, is that we make it very simple. Like I've got some databases here, right? I've got some databases. Maybe I want to migrate one of those. I, I just spun up a VM with SQL Server in it. How do I migrate my application? We can't make it any easier for you because we can say, uh, as soon as right mouse click works, right? Tasks. Whoops. Let's pick uh, one of these. One of these should work. Oh, you know what? Hold on a minute. Let me connect to my local database. That's why. So I got local databases here. And let's say I want to migrate my EventsWorks 2014. So tasks and deploy database to Windows Azure VM. 
We can't make it any easier for you to migrate your database to the cloud. And it's click, 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 done. Same thing if you want to migrate to the Azure SQL database, the pass offering, that's the menu above that. Migrate your database to Azure SQL database. Wizard step, done. Very easy to migrate. So there's, and we'll talk about Azure SQL database in a minute. But from a virtual machine standpoint, very easy to migrate. The other thing uh, uh, that you can do with these virtual machines is you're saying, well, okay, I can, I can spin, uh, I can um, uh, improve or I can lower the performance. If I, if I get the performance, maybe I don't need that much performance, so let me drop it down. You also have the ability here to say, all right, well, I want to pick a virtual machine and I want to add uh, disks to it, right? So even though some of these virtual machines come with attached local attached storage, maybe you want additional disk space. So you can attach up to, depending on the size of the virtual machine, up to 16 one terabyte drives to that virtual machine. Now the question is, do you pay for those, when you attach this disk, are you, are you paying for it? No, you're not paying for it. So I can attach 16 one terabyte disks to this virtual machine and pay nothing. And the only time I start paying is when I start adding data to these disks. Because it's storage, right, Azure storage. You're only paying for when you add the uh, items to those disks, right? So one, very easy to set up. So if I were to walk through that wizard, I'd have a, I'd have a virtual machine without a within a matter of minutes. With SQL Server already configured and running, right? Then right mouse click, deploy my database, I'm up and running, then I can add uh, disks to that. So if you're, uh, and we'll talk about some differences between this, but again, from a virtual machine perspective, if you need a quick uh, QA or test environment or want to spin something up for production, very easy to do, right? All right, let's keep going here. So, um, uh, let's, yeah, let's keep going. So the other thing, so the flip side to this is, is uh, Azure SQL Database. So we first talked about SQL, the, the infrastructure as a service, right? We'll talk about, do a little comparison here in a few minutes. But how many of you like, how many of you like to spend your day doing the physical administration of a SQL Server box. How many of you like to do patching and maintenance and upgrades and licenses and things like that? Anybody? Yeah, <laughs> there's always one guy. Yeah, that's me. Job security. <laughs> yeah, right. Nobody, you know, really nobody ever raises their hand because, you know, in, unless you're just a glutton for punishment, <laughs> right, and just like pain, right, no one likes to do that, right? But the, <laughs> but, and, and none of, really none of us like to do that, right? We like to code, we're, we're, we're SQL people. Let us do SQL things, let us code, create databases, do the logical administration of the box. The, you know, the SQL VM, this is, you know, yes, I need, to, I need to do the backups and the maintenance and the patching and the upgrades, things like that. Right? That's where you get more control. This says, I don't wanna have to worry about that. Let Microsoft, so this is SQL Server as a service, right? You still, it is full SQL Server, so tables used, so procedures, triggers, all that great stuff. Still transactional, all that great things, but it's managed as a service, so there's no VM, right? It's SQL Server as a service, so it's relational database. It's SQL Server. If you do select add at version, there's the SQL Server version because it is SQL Server, right? The things you get, it, because it's SQL Server, still works with SQL Server Management Studio, still, still works with Visual Studio, all the tools, because it is SQL Server, all the tools that you know and love today, right? One of the things, one of the differentiations between SQL and a VM, and we'll actually talk about this in a minute, between SQL and a VM and SQL database, how do you scale a virtual machine? Right, and we'll talk about that. I'm gonna ask that question again, okay? Now, here's the difference. We need to understand, right, SQL and database, because they're both SQL server, one's just running a VM, you can RDP into that virtual machine. Once we spin up that virtual machine, you can RDP into that, you have control over the box. This is logical administration. This is, we're, we're managing SQL, the, the, the environment for you, but there's benefits to that, because I don't have to do all the management and, and the patching and licensing and upgrades and things like that, but there's certain benefits to that, right? Because we're taking care of the transaction logs. Now there's three flavors of this, right? Basic, standard, and premium. And depending which flavor you want, this is a developer's delight right here. Right, because I don't have, it's just running, there's, you know, I don't have to worry about it. It's even a DBA's delight, actually. But if you think about it, right, there's, uh, there is, uh, there's benefits to, to this because I get things like geo-redundant geo uh, restore. I get things like um, uh, point-in-time recovery, things for, like, like, oops, like, you know, how many of your developers do, 
you know, your junior DBAs do a delete without a wear clause or something like that, right? And you have to recover from that. So there's, there's uh, that's people are laughing like, yeah, we've been there, been there. So things like, uh, so how do we recover from that? So there's benefits. We get, you know, dynamic data masking. We get auditing, all these great features. Uh, and depending on the performance, right, same thing like a VM. You've got different, different tiers uh, within each uh, offering. So like... Um, the S1, S2, or P1, P2, P3, things like that. I can scale based on the performance I need, right? So, and b based on that, it gives me the size of the database and how much I'm going to pay for that database. One of the, but let's be very honest and transparent here. Uh, one of the things that allows us to do that is the ability to say, all right, you know, previously when we had this offering, we had you know, the additions where, you know, you know, when I create a database, in the, in the Northern European data center, and you create a database in the Northern European data center, you know, even today, our databases could very well go on the same physical box, right? The difference here, in a VM, you can RDP into the box. You have control over the, the box. In this, you don't have control over the box, right? You can't say, where does your database get created? So you don't have, you can't RDP into the server. And that's okay with me, because I just want to code and run my database and make sure that it runs okay. That's all I want. Right? But in this environment, we have things what's called a database throughput unit. These are little, this is guaranteed performance. This says, when I create a database and I pick a specific service unit or a service level agreement, then I know I'm going to get that performance, guaranteed performance, day after day after day. Right? And we'll talk about scalability in a second. But this is how we guarantee the performance. Because again, if I'm putting my database in the cloud, I want security, I want performance, the two big things, right? I want to, I want to know that my database is going to run the same, that my, my queries that are going to run the same today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day, right? That's what I want as a developer and a DBA. I don't have to worry. Now, just because in either environment, that doesn't mean you're still not tuning your queries, right? You still have the responsibility because just because you're putting things in the cloud does not mean you, you can't hide bad code just by putting it in the cloud. Let's be honest here, right? You cannot hide bad code. In fact, it would, by putting it in the cloud, it's going to be uncovered faster. Let's be honest, right? So, and in fact, did you know that you could actually save money by tuning your queries in the cloud? You can actually save money because the faster they, you know, the, the faster they, so there's, it's not, you're not charged by how fast, but if you can improve the, t the performance, you can improve the amount of data that's coming down, Right? When data leaves the data center, you're charged for that. So if you're, if you're improving the performance and the amount of data that's coming down, you're saving money. Right? So you actually improve and, and lower your cost by tuning your queries. So again, you have to think from a developer perspective, whether it's in a VM or in SQL database, that doesn't mean you don't have to tune your queries. Right? You're still looking at performance and things like that. But this predictable performance says, based on I know based on the service tiers, I know I'm going to get predictable performance because I know I've got dedicated memory CPU, just like I do on-prem, dedicated memory CPU and I.O. To that, to that database, right? And we'll actually see that in a demo here real quick, okay? Yes? That's what I'm, so the question is, you're really saying, so the, repeating the question, you're, 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 you're asking if, if I have this large table and I have a var char max at the end, and I've got a developer that does select star from table, and I return all that data in the application, right? And I don't need to do that. So said, because I'm returning that data, if I don't need that, and I don't return that, that var char max column, are you, am I really saving money? And the answer is yes. Right? Because the more data that, you're, that you stream out of the data center, so as long as the data stays in the data center, you're fine. But anytime data leaves the data center, there's, you know, that's minimal. I mean, it's extremely minimal. But you're still saving money because, yes, yeah, so you want to look at your queries and go on. The, I mean, attend any query tuning session. Grant Fritchie, Brent Ozar, attend any query, right? And, and the worst thing a developer do in an application is select star, right? So you want to look at your queries to make sure that, because uh, you, you, yes, you can actually save money by looking at what your queries are doing, right? 
The only time you want to do a select star is to say, hey, maybe I, you know, top 100 rows or something like that. Look to see what kind of, but never in a production, right? So you can actually save money, yes, by looking at that, okay? All right, does it answer your question? Yeah, so the answer is yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely, right? Absolutely, very interesting. All right, so now I'm going to go back to the question again, right? So scale, how do I scale a database? How do you scale a virtual machine? Can you scale a virtual machine? And if so, how? Right? What's that? Huh? Well, okay, so there's, let's, let's talk, because it's sort of a trick question, because you can, so you need to understand scale, right? So there's scale uh, up and down, right? So there's vertical scale and there's horizontal scale. Scale up and down, scale in and out, right? So to scale a virtual machine, and I'll show you. So remember when I went into the portal and I said, hey, I want to go from an A3 to an A, to maybe a D2, right? Give me more memory. That scale, that's a vertical scale, right? Just give me more memory and CPU. And as a developer, that's how we hide bad code. Just throw more memory and CPU at it. Solves all the problems, You're right? No, <laughs> right? Because at some point, you, can, uh, you, you, you can't add more memory and CPU to, to a machine, right? So there's vertical scale, adding more memory and CPU, but even that, you're gonna tap out at some point. You can't add any more memory and CPU to a machine. So, but, but you can't scale a virtual machine horizontally, because there's only one, right? So how do you scale? But So elastic scale su says, which applies to only Azure SQL database, uh, the, the, uh, horizontal scale. Let me take one, my one database, and partition that database. So instead of having thousands of users hitting that one database, I've got thousands of users hitting multiple databases. So what I've done is I've sharded or partitioned my database from one, and dynamically, by the way, from one database to hundreds of databases and back down to one if I need to, right? This gives me the performance, the dynamic scale gives me the performance I need. For, and, and the great thing from a, from a application development standpoint, my application, doesn't need to know about it. It doesn't change, right? Customer ID 10 is gonna be in this database today and it may be in another database tomorrow, but does my application care? No, my application doesn't care because I'm dynamically scaling my database. And as long as my shard map in my application is up to date, which it always is, I'm good, right? So this is what a, a Elastic Scale does and it only applies to Azure SQL Database is that let me part dynamically partition my data from one database to 10 databases. This is one of the benefits of the cloud too, right? This is why, you know, we're thinking about the cloud. You can't do this on prem because it's, you know, how do you do all of a sudden you're spinning up new databases, but in, in because of the the uh, architecture and environment of Azure, it makes it very easy to scale, right? And my application doesn't have to change, right? So, let's jump out and do a couple more demos. So, I'm going to do some uh, some perf and then hopefully if this uh, this succeeded and did not error Yep, it aired, doggone it. Uh, we might be able to do the other demo. The internet here hasn't been. All right, so let's do this demo. All right, so what I have here is I have, uh, I've got some queries. So if we look at uh, like this P1, for example, let's look at a query for that. And when I just said select star from, I'm gonna, about to do, I'm gonna do a select star right here. So don't get mad at me for doing that. All right, so we're gonna do Select star from GUIDs one, right? And all I have here is a table of IDs and GUIDs, okay? So I've got four of these tables. If you look at it, four tables, and there's not that many rows. I think there's only 20 rows in each, okay? But what I have here is I have a, a P1 database. I have an S1 database. Where's my S1? S1, and I have a basic database. So if you remember, you know, depending on P1, I had, uh, let's go back to that. Right, so I had I, I had essentially uh, different amounts of uh, uh, um, resources assigned to each. So I got an S1, which is 20 DTUs, and a P1, which is 125, and a basic, which is five. Now you're asking, well, how much memory CPU and I/O is associated per DTU? Well, that's you know there, that's documented on the web. I'm not going to tell you about that. You can go find that information. It's just just know that each DTU has a certain amount of memory, CPU, and I/O associated to it. So like 20 DTUs might equate to four gig of RAM and 
uh, a certain amount of I.O. and memory associated to it, right? So with that, what I'm going to do is the whole predictable performance thing says, uh, I'm going to execute this query. And if you look at this, if your developer ever, write, ever writes a query like that, they should update their resume, right? This is a very poor, on purpose, this is a very poorly written, res, uh, poorly written query, OK? It does three cross joins, OK? And it, remember, so it's, each table only has 20 rows in it, right? So, but this is doing a cross joint or a cross joint or a cross joint or a cross joint, very horribly written query at, on purpose, OK? So I'm going to ex execute this, and I'm going to go and execute the same query, same query against an S1, right? And then in a basic. And what we're going to see is how long they take. And, th and then if I execute it over and over again. So here is, let me execute this. Now, granted, uh, just for purposes, uh, I, th this Azure SQL database server is in the West US. So this might take still a, a couple seconds to execute, right? So we'll execute this. Then we'll go over here and execute this. And we'll go over here and execute that, right? So this should return already in one second which is pretty good for a horribly written query. One second. This is still running, and that is still running. So we can execute this again. Execute, one second. Execute, one second. Execute, one second. So, this so again, this is shows predictable performance. I know that a, that a query is going to take the same time every time I execute this, right? Every time. This is because I said I want, I want uh, dedicated re resources, memory, CPU, and I.O. to the database, right? This is probably done in about, yep, 16 seconds, and this is 39 seconds, okay? And I know that if I execute this again, this will take, again, if I execute it, 16 seconds, right? If I execute that other one, basic, it'll take 39 seconds, right? Give or take a few uh, uh, microseconds, okay? All right. Uh, what I wanted to show you was, uh, b but because I think there's internet issues and it aired because I don't know what, uh, it says it already exists. I don't know what, it's, it's having problems. Uh, but I will, sh I will try to attempt to show you the demo. But what I have here is I have a bunch of, so think about from a, from a sharding perspective, I have this simple sample application. We can't run it, if I try to run this, it's gonna, it's gonna fail. But we can at least try, I'm gonna show you the UI. Yes? So the question is, uh, if someone else has, it, it, so if my database and your database are on the same physical machine. So if I'm doing something, then then you start doing something and taking resources. Is that is that going to affect my performance of my database? Is your question correct? And the answer is no, because remember, uh, so uh, I have that those those resources are dedicated to me, right? So if I create a, like this P1 or S1, whatever it is, that data that database, those resources are mine. No one else can have those resources, right? So when you create a database on and say, I want an S1, then you get your dedicated resources. I cannot touch those resources. So let's say for just for uh, argument's sake, I create an S1 database, and that equates to 4 giga RAM, uh, certain CPU, and I.O., right? You created another S1, you get the same amount of resources. Those are reserved for you, right? Mine are reserved for me. You cannot touch my resources. So I know I'm going to get that performance predictable every time. Because when I, when, I, when I execute a query, I'm not executing against your resources. I'm executing. So think of it like a little computer within a computer. When I spin up an S1, it's giving me a little computer that's with dedicated resources in, with, uh, on that box. Same thing with yours and everybody else's on that box. Yep, basic as well, right? Yeah, so that's a good question. I was just, I, I was just gonna show that. So, so not to confuse everybody, so if you look at, let's go back to the portal and look at uh, so SQL database servers, right? So it says, you think about here, so available quota. So this server, here's the one in, let's say, Northern Europe, 2,000 DTUs available. So when I spit, so that means, and let's be, so, so let's be completely uh, honest here, right? So we have to think about how Azure SQL Database works, right? So this, this server is not a, a, a physical server. So when I create databases on, this is just a TDS endpoint, right? When I create a, a database on the server, it's gonna go on one server in the data center. 
When I create another database, it's not going to go more than likely, not going to go on that same server. It's going to go on some other server. So I may have, what, how many databases do I have? And I've got 20 databases. More than likely, those 20 databases are on 20 different servers in the data center. I don't care about that. I really don't. All I care about is that my databases perform. Right? True statement. I don't care where they're at. I just want, right? What this says is, is that, you know, that logical server has X amount of DTUs available. So as I start, like for example, when I started, right, this one right here is my, if we look in this one, this is my West US. And notice I already have all these databases on it. So what it did is it started subtracting, so that only has 1,750 DTUs left per quota, right? Not physical, that just means that, you know, it really doesn't matter, as long as I just, you know, uh, when I create a database, as long as there's enough DTUs on that logical server, I'm okay. And it really, I, I really don't care, I'm just creating databases and assigning a specific memory CPU and I.O. to that database. Does that make sense? I want to make sure I answer your question. Yours, yeah? Okay, yes. Uh, big, well, because there, there's, there's still, if you think about it, I'm not quite sure 100%, but if you think about it, there's still a physical box back there, and there's still limited memory and CPU on that box. So what they did is they basically said, look, here's how much memory and CPU are on this physical box. So every logical server can have only this amount of DTU, so we're not you know, uh, making unlimited amount, we're not stressing out that box too much, right? So I think it's just to protect it, still protect it. To, to me, it's still protecting that we're not stressing out the box too much, right? But again, it's my database is here, I got another database here. Right? That's not a physical box, right? That's just a logical endpoint. But I think that's just because to say, look, you, um, so you're not go wild on, you know, create like a thousand, <laughs> a thousand P1 databases and just, right, make stress out the environment. All right, does this, does this make sense? All right, uh, what I want to do is just very quickly, because I think we, we, uh, we're halfway through. Uh, yep, so in, in this environment, I want to talk about scale real quick. So for some, I don't know why this error, it's just, I think, internet issues. You, you always blame the internet. Um, so what this what so scale what scale says is that when, if I were to fire this off, what this did is it basic. There's two ways you can shard. So you look at all these peer one databases. What I did is I went and pre-created all these databases. So there's two ways you can really do elastic scale, horizontal partitioning. In this case, I went and just to make it a very simple demo, I pre-created the databases. So when I start this, what it does is it says, all right, I'm going to start filling one database. And then what it will do is when it hits, so in, in elastic scale, you can set thresholds to say, based on either memory or CPU or size of database or things like that, when it hits this threshold, scale to the next database, create another database, create another database when I start, right? So what this does is it says it hits one database and starts just slamming it with uh, inserts and updates and creates and things like that. When it, when it hits that, it'll create another database. So you'll, it'll start walking around, you know, you'll see squares popping up here. And I apologize, I mean, if I can get it running, I'll, I can show you after. But dynamic scale essentially says, don't limit me to one database. When I hit a threshold, whether it's memory or CPU or I.O., scale up. So, the, and the reason you'd wanna do something like this is think about uh, Easter's coming up, right? And you're, you're, a, um, you're a retailer, you have things you want to sell. Right, on-prem, how? What do you do to support the load when you have a sale? Right, you have to go pre-buy all this hardware. Right, and when the sale's over, what do you do with all that hardware? What well, sits? It sit. Most a lot of it's very underutilized and sitting there collecting dust. Correct. So what this says is, I don't want to have to go pre-buy my hardware. What I want to do is just dynamically scale as the load increases. Let me scale. Right, it completely hands off. So, you know, Easter, a uh, 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 week before Easter, my orders start coming in and it starts automatically scaling, right? And how do I partition that? Dif another discussion, but it starts scaling different data, uh, you know, from one database to 20 databases, whatever the load needs. And when the load is done, it'll automatically scale back down to one or two databases, however many need to support the load. And the great thing about that, and the great thing about cloud application development is you only pay for those resources that you just used. Right? 
So instead of having all this underutilized hardware, I just scaled from one database to 20 databases, just paid for what I used, and when I was done, I went back down to one. Right? And a lot of the questions is, if we go back to here, let's go back to the slide real quick. So the question is, you know, why would we do something like this? Right? So let's, okay. What is the difference? Why would I use an Azure VM over Azure SQL Database? Why would I use the infrastructure as a service versus platform as a service, right? How many of us, what was the biggest database size that you could have for Azure SQL Database? Did anybody know, uh, remember from that slide? 500 gig. Who here has a da database bigger than 500 gig? Most people do, right? So what are your options, right? Well, does that mean you cannot use Azure SQL Database? No, that, that doesn't mean that. Right? If I want to get quickly up into Azure, that means I spin up a VM, migrate my database, because it supports bigger than 500 gig, I'm off and running. Okay? Well, because we have now Elastic Scale, you can take that database. Let's say you've got a two terabyte database. Okay? I just spin up four Azure SQL databases, partition my data, and go. Right? Now it's easier said than done, but it's still possible. So now instead of having thousands of user, users hitting that one database, I have thousands of users. I just distributed my, my load across four databases, so I get better performance, right? And the gr other thing about this is, if you look at the pricing structure, it might be, instead of having one massive P3 database, you'll probably get better performance and save money by spinning up maybe four S2 databases, right? So. Uh, better performance and probably cost savings by going by, by partitioning your data, right? So if you look at the price of a P3 for over a month, that's probably a lot more expensive than four S2s over a month. Now you have to do the math. I'm not saying that's the way it is, but you know, plus you get better performance over over that, right? Because now you have m many users hitting multiple databases, not just one. Does that make sense? So things you know, things like how much do you con how much control do you want over the environment? Um, you know, can you dynamically scale, things like that, right? Um, uh, it's still full SQL Server functionality with the new V12 stuff. It's pretty, it's on par parity, but things like Azure SQL Database still doesn't use, you still can't do full text search. There's no agent, there's no service broker yet, things like that. For the most part, it's on parity, but if you need, you know, some things that aren't in Azure SQL Database, you need to go to Azure VM, right? Okay, any questions so far? We good? All right. Uh, so, let's keep going. So, what about the NoSQL? So, we've just talked about relational, Azure SQL and a VM, Azure SQL Database, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. We're now still sticking with platform as a service, but from a developer's perspective, uh, how do I do, you know, document data store? How, you know, if I want to store, how many of you store documents or blobs in your database? Right. Well, a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people do. Well, that, what that does is that increases the size of your database, right? So, now you're, your, your database now goes, might be under 500 gigabyte, might, now might fit in Azure SQL Database, right? Plus, it's going to be cheaper storage anyway if you get, get those the files out. So what DocumentDB is, is a JSON document data store offered as a service, okay? Doesn't do XML yet, right? But right now, it's a JSON document. So how do we do, uh, how, how do, we do a document data store? So this basically said this is a cloud only. It only works in Azure, but it's a, a, a pure, scalable document data store. And the architecture is fairly simple. It's think of it almost like a relational database, almost, right? Because, and we'll talk about this, and I'll show this in a demo in a second. So you've got a database. Those databases can have collections. Each collection can have documents, and those documents can have attachments. I've got users and permissions assigned to databases, but that's how it is, right? This is a doc th those familiar with Mongo or Couch or things like that, very similar, right? Got a database, that database has collections, those collections can have documents, and those documents can have attachments. Who's familiar with Mongo? Anybody, who's familiar with Mongo, right? What's, what's the query language like to query Mongo? Ugly, okay, very ugly. What's the query syntax for querying document DB? T SQL or link, language integrated query, right? This is awesome because you don't have to be a rocket scientist now to query a document data store, right? So let me show you how that works. So any questions about this before I jump into a demo? Okay, so let me show you how this works because this is actually pretty interesting, okay? So I need to fire up 
Visual Studio. And most people saw this uh, in my pre-con the other day. So I have a, dev, a, a document DB, and let me just show you the code. It is very simple. We'll walk through a very simple, very simple example. This is how easy it is, right? So what I've got is I've got a very simple uh, environment. So I'm going to create, if you can see this, let me uh, see if I can increase this code a little bit. I am. All right. So I'm going to create a new database. In that database, I'm going to call that database sample database. Uh, I'm going to create a collection in that uh, database called families. Then I'm going to upload some JSON documents to that, and they look, they look like this. So some very simple JSON documents. Okay. So there's one JSON document. Right? There's the Anderson family. We've got uh, one kid and some pets, or one pet. Okay. Uh, the Wakefield family, same thing. They have this family has two kids and two pets, Goofy and Shadow. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm uploading those documents to the document data store. Those are JSON documents. Uploading those to the document data store. Whoops. And what's even better about this, better about this is uh, I can uh, use there is link to query my T SQL or to query my document, and there is T SQL, right? Simple, simple T SQL to query a document data store, okay? And did you know that in um, what I'm going to do also? Did you know that uh, Document DB also has the ability to create stored procedures, okay? It also has the ability to create triggers and use it to find functions. Awesome. Okay, so in this example, I've got a store procedure that basically says swap pets. So what it does in this example, it takes the pets from the Anderson family and Wakefield family and swaps them. Okay, very simple. So within just a few lines of code, I am creating a, a database, creating a collection, uploading documents to that collection, and then creating a store procedure to swap the pets in just a few lines of code, right? Using language and technologies that we already use today, T-SQL and .NET, okay? So if we run this, uh, let's just run this. So what I've done is I've created a database. It's gonna say, hey, Andersons have a son named, as long as the internet works, there we go. All right, let's go back to that because I put a breakpoint there. Right, so Anderson family has the following pets, Fluffy, and that remember that was the link query. Then the An Andersons have a son named John in grade seven. The Anderson family has the following pets, right? So we swapped those, so that was a statement. So I used link and .NET. And if you guys want this sample, I'm happy to send you this sample. But it, very simple, what I did is in a few lines of code, you created, uh, used, uh, created a database, created a collection, uploaded documents to that collection, and used familiar syntax to work with Azure Document DB, right? A online, a cloud database document data store. Right now it only does JSON, but we might do uh, XML later, right? So this is the ability to say if you've got documents. So it does not do things like you can't take your Word documents or things like that. This is just for JSON documents right now, okay? So if you've got Word or you know file, other types of, this is just a, jo a document data store, okay? Um, but it's, it's as simple as that, okay? Uh, and then, then I go and delete my database. But what this says is, um, uh, I also can create this, so I, I can go in the portal, so that through the portal and I can create my database, I can create my collection, I can upload documents through there, things like that, right? We won't get into that, but this is just to show you very quickly that I can use familiar syntax and technologies, T-SQL to query my document data store, right? This is powerful. You're not, you don't have to learn a whole new, right? But this is about to say, if I'm developing an application for the cloud and I want to do, you know, if I need a document data store, right, this is very simple, right, a very easy thing to do. Right, any questions about this? All right, uh, let's keep going. All right, 15 minutes. All right. So I know we're going kind of high level, right, but this is just a kind of an introduction to what our, our document, da our, our data services are. All right, so two more. So I'm not going to do a demo around these because these are sort of fairly, these are, have been around for a long time, but this is Azure storage. So think about, um, we talked about relational, we, we've done a document data store, and now we have, you know, we're talking about 
continue to the NoSQL discussion, but this is Azure blobs and, and tables, right? When we talk about Azure blobs and tables, who's familiar with Azure storage? Right, just a couple of you. So we need to think about this in terms of this is not relational. This is NoSQL. Azure blobs, like if you want to take your data, this is where, you know, for those who raise their hand on, you know, if you're putting your documents in your database, this is where you'd pull your documents out. If you've got like Word files or things like that, you pull them out of your database, you put them here in blob storage, right? How much does it cost to store a one gig file in Azure blob storage for a month? Anybody know? You want to take a guess? Uh, actually, less. Uh, somewhere about it's, it's seven, seven to nine cents. So it's not yes. So ten cents, give or take, it's probably it's probably less than ten cents. Okay, but ten cents to store a one gig file in Azure, right? So it's a lot more than that to put it on your disk, right? So for ten cents, I can store a one gig file in in, in storage for a month, right? So think about if I've got a terabyte of data, you know, that's pretty cheap, right? So why am I putting this information, why am I putting this in my database? Why am I putting these blobs and things like this in my database when I can have much better performance and much cheaper storage in Azure Blob Storage? Tables is a little different. Tables is a, no, is, is a key value pair. One of the, one of the um, uh, I don't want to say problems, but one of the, it's almost a problem. When people work with that, they see Azure Table Storage, they think this is another relational database, and it is not that, right? This is Azure Tables. This is a key value pair. You cannot do joins between tables. There's no primary key, foreign key. There's no RI. If you were to put a sniffer on any traffic going to and from Azure Tables, it's key value pair, right? So don't take your relational database and put it in Azure Tables, because that's not what it's meant for. It will fail miserably. Right? But I would use this for things like historical data or transient data, things I would need to temporarily store some uh, table information. Right? I might do that. Okay? But I would not put my relational database in there. Twitter, I'd put in, in Azure Tables every day. If I did a Twitter type of client, I'd put that in there because it's just a key value pair. Right? But I would not put a relational database in that. Okay? All right, no, no demo here just because it's fairly, it's fairly simple. But the question is now, I've talked about kind of relational and NoSQL and things like that, right? But what's missing here is, you know, one of the challenges around Azure SQL Database is there's no full text search. But one of the great features that was just, uh, just about to release is what we call Azure Search, right? Azure Search is a platform as a service full text search capability that allows you to uh, index and search across all our platform as a service uh, data technologies, right? SQL database, document DB. As long as I've got a database or a table, you know, a database or documents in Azure, in Azure SQL database or document DB, I can index those documents. Okay, so it makes it very simple. So one of the things here is again, it is search as a service. Uh, I can spin up a search service very quickly. I can spin it up, create indexes, uh, create an index, and say, all right apply that index to this table or things like that. So I can go have it go crawl all my data out there and say, all right, go index this. So when we went, you know, think about your search experiences when you go online, right? So I hit a web page, you're out at Amazon or whatever, right? When you do a search, there's certain functionality that you want out of that search, right? You want type ahead, right? So I start typing, give me a drop down. I want things like if I mistype, right? I want that to be smart enough to go, I meant this, so go pull this information back, right? So think about like AdventureWorks, I type mountain bikes. So I type mountain, I spell it wrong. It should be smart enough to know, okay, I'm gonna go and pull out mountain bikes because that's what I meant, right? So why search? Because again, I, I want these search criteria, I want these search capabilities. I wanna be able to have one search functionality that spans all my Azure data services, not just full text search and SQL, but if I'm taking my application and I'm moving that to the cloud, I want to be able to search everything, relational, non-relational, no SQL, it doesn't matter, right? Give me that search criteria. And if you, uh, anybody ever tried to build their own search functionality, it's hard, right? Because how do you do this matching and pairing and how do you do scoring and indexing and things like that? That's hard. But Microsoft has spent almost over a decade building this search criteria, right? They use it in Bing, they use it in, um, on Channel 9, everywhere, right? 
Their Microsoft Research has spent tons. And think about if I have a multi-language support. Think about the ability, because this exists today in, in search. Think about the ability to have a map, draw on that map like a, a polygon, and go, all right, search everything within that polygon. That exists today in Azure Search, right? So I can do scoring and indexing and filtering and all that kind of stuff. So with that, let's wrap up and do searching, right? So uh, to, just to make it very simple, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, where's my mouse? I'm going to do it this way. So I'm, I, I'm not going to pull up an I'm not going to pull up an application and show a bunch of code because I think that's um, be too cumbersome. But what I am going to do is I'm going to pull up uh, this application. So uh, hopefully, I know this is being recorded, and there's no, uh, but so hopefully they'll forgive me for pulling up a Google product. <laughs> but I'm going to pull up a Google product, right? And the only reason I'm doing this is because it, it uh, shows the power and flexibility of search, right? And we're actually hitting a search service. So this will take a couple seconds to, to come up. But this is actually pretty, pretty nice. Right. Uh, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be basically be hitting a URI endpoint that's going to be hitting our search service, and it demonstrates the ability to do search capabilities that you can do in any application through our API. But we're just to, just for demo purposes, we're going to be using the URI. Right. So hopefully this will make sense. All right. So what I have here is I have uh, I'm using what's called the Postman in Google. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but it actually makes it very easy to do URI type statements. Okay. So what we've done is, uh, so I'm going to uh, notice that this is hitting uh, my Azure search service. There's my Azure search service, right there, right? My epic, I called it my epic search, okay? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run uh, this statement. Well, it's going to do, it's going to delete this, it's going to delete the index. It's, it's probably already gone, but okay, no indexes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an index. And this index says, I'm going to create an index called stadiums. And then I want in the index, I want it to index these columns. So the size rank, the stadium name, the capacity, the city, state, location, and the teams that play in that stadium, right? So any documents that I upload to, uh, that I upload to, uh, or that I include in the search, it's gonna index on those columns, right? So it needs to index on those columns. The, 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 the documents, if I want it to use this index, the documents must have those columns, okay? So I'm going to create this index, okay, this will take a second, okay, so there's my index, you can see that it created all the good information, perfect. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload some documents to Azure, uh, to, uh, 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 to Azure Search, I'm going to have, so when I upload it, it's going to automatically index those documents. You can see that these, these documents, and they're just simple JSON documents. They include, there's the state, you know, everything that we include in this. There's the city, the state, the capacity, everything. It's got all the columns and properties, right, that my index is gonna include. So I'm gonna upload those documents, and that won't take that long, right? So that's already done. So I uploaded those documents. Okay, so we've got all these documents. So what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna do a very simple query. And this very simple URI just says, uh, search where the stadium is in, the, the, stadium, the city, for the stadium is in Seattle, okay? That's what we're saying here. So if you notice that, it says we're uh, search Seattle, and it's going to search all those all those on all those index columns, okay? So if I run this, it's going to pull back two uh, uh, two documents, right? There's Century League Field where our Seattle Seahawks football team plays football, not soccer, but football, and uh, huh? Oh, that's true. I forgot you get that very good point, Sounders. This, this, guy, this guy knows. Very good, All right? Uh, and then Husky Stadium, where the college football team plays. Sounders, yes, yeah, yeah, so maybe they didn't put that in there, which is interesting, All right? But uh, so this lists, um, did it list it there? Just did it list? So it didn't list the teams. Did it list the teams? Yeah, Huskies and the Seattle Seahawks. So it should, yeah, we should see another record there for the Sounders, yes. The Sounders is actually a pretty good team. All right, so this one just said, just where the, you know, where, where search, uh, search for the word Seattle, and it found these two documents, okay? We're gonna do another one where it says, um, 
Uh, this is where we do a, uh, give it a latitude and longitude. So notice we give it here at the very end. We give it a latitude. We use the geography method and we give it a longitude and longitude and say, give me all the stadiums where that are less than or equal to, that's the LE, 100 kilometers of that latitude and longitude point. So go out 100 kilometers and everything within that 100 kilometers, pull back all the stadiums, okay? So this is, remember, this is the, um, the mapping feature in Azure Search, just like I drew something, right? But this is a circle, okay? So if I search this, it's probably gonna come back and pull out the same two stadiums. Yep, Husky Stadium and CenturyLink Field, okay? But same thing, so apparently, you know, we like Seattle a lot, <laughs> right? And this one is a bit little better. This one actually says, I want not just, don't just give me a, a, a circle. If we were to take this and post this in Notepad, for example, right? That's a, uh, that's, a that's a, I went and did this. So that's like a draw a country or a county, right? That's one of these things, right? So I just took my, uh, I just drew whatever on a map not a circle, it could be whatever form, and those are all the points. So if I want to say, give me all the cars or something within whatever I drew, right, not just within a, within a distance, but within this area that I drew, give me everything in there, okay? So because we like Seattle, it's gonna return the same two stadiums. So this is kind of a bad example because it returns the same two stadiums, but trust me, this is not smoke and, me this is not smoke and mirrors, it's returning the, the actual data, okay? Um, we can then do a, a, scoring, a scoring profile, and a scoring profile basically says, and I won't run this, but a scoring profile basically says, look, rank these, the importance, uh, based on distance or based on, you know, uh, how, you know, so when you do a Google search, right, or a Bing, sorry, Google, I said Google, when you do a Bing search, right, uh, you know, how are they, you know, what's ranked the highest, right? So this is what a ranking does, is it says, you know, it puts weight on the results that are returned. So for example, when you do that less than 100 uh, kilometers search, the things that are closest to that latitude and longitude point may have higher weight because they're closer to you. They might match some of the, you know, it might say, you know, uh, filter on price or distance or, you know, color, what has more weight? And that, that actually scores higher, okay? So you do scoring profiles, things like that. This then has the ability to say, all right, I'm going to index, you know, this is a very simple example, but it shows the power of search because I can search on anything. But now I can say, all right, I've got my search, go out and index document DB documents, go out and search my Azure SQL database database, go out and search my database in SQL in a VM, go out and index and search storage, things like that. I now have not just SQL Server full text search, but I have full text search across all our Azure data services. Right, what makes it, which makes this very powerful. One of the things about this is also that, uh, I'm not gonna just do time, is multi-language support, right? So not just English, but think about it in terms of any, uh, all the other languages, right? One of the examples is it, it, when you talk uh, uh, Asia type languages and think about these characters, right? When you have a character and you put a, you know, it might mean one thing, but if you put another character in front of that original character, it may change the, the meaning of this first character drastically. So how do you search on that when you, you know, when you have characters that change meaning based on what's around it, right? And Azure Search, you know, any search capability needs to take that in consideration. And so uh, Azure Search has multi-language support, be able to search this and be able to take care of, of these type of scenarios, right? Okay, so we are out of time. So, uh, Let's go back to the deck, okay? Uh, we're done. Oh, I, I don't have a, I, I was gonna show an Uber Epic demo, but don't have time for Uber. So there's an application out there that I'll point you to that uh, actually has all of these services in one application that shows you how to uh, basically stitch these together, okay? Uh, and it's actually a pretty nice demo. All right, so I am done, I'm out of time. Any, a uh, couple minutes for questions, any questions? I know this was very fast, very sort of high level. We tried to go deep, but uh, this was to show the power and the flexibility of all our Azure data servers and how you might use these in a, 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 a cloud application. So hopefully this was helpful. Any questions? Yes.
So the question is, in, in my demo, I created an index first and then uploaded a demo, uh, right? Is there, you're asking, is there a way to have it just say, uh, just point to whatever and, uh, yeah, I think there's gonna be a way when it GAs, when it uh, is generally available to say, all right, go uh, find out what's out there and index that information. Yeah, yep, so yes. All right, any other questions? Was this helpful? Okay. Very good. All right, well, thanks for coming. Appreciate it.